Hello, and welcome to the May webinar presentation by the Underground Construction Association Younger Members Group. My name is Colin Sessions, and I'm one of the members of the UCA of SME Standing Committee for Young Members. I am joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, Shannon Goff, the University Outreach Chair, Everett Litton, the Membership Chair, and Dimitrio Kruskalo, the Media Chair. The UCA Young Members Group is a standing committee of UCA of SME that consists of professionals of all ages who strive to attract and develop engineers and construction professionals 35 and under. Each month we put on a free webinar of various tunneling topics that are available to all interested parties. Before we begin this month's webinar, I have a couple announcements. Once again this year, the Young Members Group is hosting a, web, a networking event for, the, uh, for young members at RATC. The networking event is held at the Lion's Share on Monday, June 5th, starting at 8 p.m. We would like to thank SAK Construction, McMillan Jacobs Associates, Briarly Associates, and Hayward Baker for sponsoring the network event. We encourage all young members attending RATC to join us for this event. Finally, those who logged into the webinar early saw an advertisement for next month's webinar. Rob Holtz from Laney Directional Drilling will be presenting on, in, on the engineering and construction considerations for the direct pipe method. Uh, look for more information on registering for that webinar as the uh, date approaches. Today, Dr. Felice will be presenting on SEM design and construction. Dr. Felice is a managing principal at CW Felice and an adjunct professor in the Department of Civil and Coastal Engineering at the University of Florida. He is a professional engineer registered in 17 states, Puerto Rico, and four provinces in Canada. His underground and tunneling projects have included transit and transportation, deep and surface mine, hydropower systems, nuclear waste repositories, and underground defense systems. Dr. Felice is a retired U.S. Air Force civil engineering officer with over 27 years of service and held the rank of lieutenant colonel. He is the current chair of AFF-60, the Tunnel and Underground Structures Committee of, for the, of the Transportation Research Board, and is a past member of the Committee on the Geological and Geotechnical Engineering for the National Research Council, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Felice earned his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Ohio University, his master's degree in facilities management from the Air Force Institute of Technology, and his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Utah. Dr. Felice, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much, Colin, and uh, welcome everybody and good day. Uh, what I've done here is tried to organize my, my lecture so that it represents a range of uh, information. I don't have an appreciation, but I expect there are those attending the seminar that may be new to underground construction, and maybe even some that are exceptionally experienced. Uh, what I hope to do is give some uh, background and hopefully some information that each one of you can, can take away. Uh, what I certainly like to do is is have an appreciation of how the ground uh, works in the area of sequential excavation, uh, design and construction. And if I achieve anything, it's to make sure that each of you are not like the young structural engineer who was assigned to a tunnel project I was working on and after a few weeks came into my office and said, wow, I didn't appreciate how much the ground influenced tunnel design. So if we can avoid that at the end of the uh, lecture, I think I'll be successful. So with that, uh, let's begin. I've organized the lecture into three basic topics. Uh, what is sequential excavation and providing a bit of historical perspective? Talk a little bit about some of the applications of sequential excavation uh, technology, as well as some advantages and disadvantages. And then we'll spend uh, the bulk of the lecture on uh, topics in design and construction. So let's start off about what is SEM. Many of you have heard uh, probably a number of terms floated in the literature. Uh, one that's extremely common is the new Austrian tunneling method. I uh, used to have a business partner and he was a very substantial individual at about 6'5 and about 240, so I didn't argue with him all that much. 
but his position was that it was the new Austrian tunneling method was neither new nor Austrian. Uh, and again, at 65250, I didn't argue with him very much. But you might uh, see that a bit of his uh, opinion as we go through the next few slides. The more common method, or I'd like to present, is the sequential excavation method. You may also see in the literature sprayed concrete lining method, shotcrete support method, sequential support method, shotcrete method, observational method, and observational tunneling method. These are all terms that you may come across as you look into the literature and see projects and applications of what we're going to talk about today. You can go back and look at some of the older literature and see that there has been sequential excavation or the ability to use pockets and sequentially select portions of a profile to excavate uh, over, an, over a period of years. Uh, different methods have been identified with different parts of nationalities and they've been around for quite a long time. Um, I provided some of the references that you can see these uh, techniques presented and actually at the end of the slide set I've included a set of references so that you can have some guidance and where to go look up uh, some of the information and support material that I've used in the lecture. From a historical perspective, uh, sequential excavation has a very long history going back into the 1800s. The conventional uh, use of NATM really evolved in the 60s with Rabisowitz in his paper in the World Power uh, Journal. And a lot of it has to do with the ability of our techniques to understand ground behavior and the ability to calculate and apply new technology and techniques to support the ground during the construction. And this is uh, what we'll see as we move forward in the lecture. It's also, and it'll be uh, emphasized later on, that the sequential excavation is not so much a method as it is a philosophy, and it is approach to how you address and work with the ground and understand how the ground behaves uh, during your excavation and how and what choices you make among the alternatives to support that excavation and advance each round during construction. These are some quotes from Rabisowitz's uh, uh, water power paper in 1964. And what you can see is that the common theme around the, the notes here are that uh, you want to be able to support unstable ground, you want to be able to do this in a systematic way, and you want to be able to plan and adjust as you perform the excavation. So it truly is an observational, very systems-oriented approach to excavation. So that's a quick overview and some of the historical perspectives of sequential excavation and some of the names that you might come across within the literature. Let's talk a little bit about some of the applications and, and how you can use the, uh, the technique. As I mentioned earlier, this is really an, it's not a, a, a method, it's more of an approach and a philosophy. And it really centers around how you provide and choose among ground support options to adapt to the ground conditions. Uh, what we're going to look at later on in a lecture is ground reaction curves, which are very integral to how you understand and be able to predict what the ground is going to do and what support should be selected as you continue your excavation. And integral to the process is the direct observations from uh, you in the tunnel and the instrumentation that's now being used uh, to understand how the ground is deforming and what you should do in response to that deformation. A significant component of sequential excavation is that can be used and applied to a number and a range of ground conditions. If you have very, very uh, weak ground, you can support it uh, with a number of different uh, methods and support means. But as you run to very uh, high uh, or, or intact rock or support ground conditions where you need minimal support, you can use it there too. It's also amenable to a range of excavation methodologies. So. 
It's a very versatile method. It's very flexible. It's adaptable and it can be used in a number of uh, different applications and conditions from cross passages to large caverns. These are some of the uh, application areas. I'll show some images in a, in a second from CERN, which is the physics laboratory in Switzerland, where they've had some very large non-circular cross sections. Uh, it's, it's a technique that you can apply to very variable and complex ground conditions, which is one of its significant advantages. It can be economical because you don't have to apply it to worst case conditions because you can adapt as you continue your excavation and go forward in your, in your work. Uh, Just an example of some of the complex structures that you can uh, use these techniques or a philosophy on. Uh, again, this is the CERN facility, uh, an underground physics uh, cavern. Non-circular cross sections, again, in the CERN application where you can apply ground support and use uh, different geometries to, rather than a circular opening. So if you were to summarize the advantages, it is a very flexible method. It's, it's adaptable to a range of ground conditions. Uh, it's, it's generally safe uh, as you adapt to those ground conditions and understand the ground conditions you're excavating in. It can be very economical because you're adapting and adjusting as you go. So it's a very broad use of, a, uh, of an excavation technology that is available to us in the underground area. Some of the disadvantages, though, uh, it may not be, well, I don't consider these so much disadvantages as things that you need to pay close attention to. It does require a very high level of coordination uh, at the face and with the crews. Uh, it's very heavily dependent on the ability of the crews at the face and their familiarity with the equipment that they're using, the excavation methods, and the response of the ground, and you, if uh, you are the superintendent at the, at the face, uh, to understand what those working conditions are and the capabilities of your crew, because they, were, they will definitely uh, affect things like production rates and the safety of the ground uh, as you continue your excavation. You're not going to have exceptionally fast production rates. It's going to vary. Um, I've seen production rates for meter or two meter round lengths from a, from a shift to weeks, uh, depending on the ground conditions and the ability of the crew and their experience. Uh, once you start, it's generally not advised to have a lot of disruptions. Um, you can provide additional ground support if you'd like to have breaks, but it's generally uh, appropriate to continue the excavation and run multiple shifts to complete uh, the work as soon as possible. Now we'll spend the rest of the uh, the time on some of the design and construction aspects. And one of the things you'll see is there are a lot of moving parts into sequential excavation uh, design and construction. I've only been able to hit on some highlights of the topics here and again there are some references for you to dive in more deeply uh, for specific areas at the end of the lecture. So let's first talk about what you need to have in order to begin this process. What we're trying to achieve is a safe and satisfactory ground support decision. And that will always start with uh, your explorations and understanding of the groundwater and geology and what you can learn about the material before uh, you, you begin your work uh, through laboratory and in situ field testing. <coughs> so again, this is pre-excavation and you can also improve the information you gain as you learn and observe what uh, material you're excavating in and through. So you want to continue to use that Bayesian approach, if you will, and learn and converge on better understanding of the ground conditions as you go, which is the basis of an observational method during construction and incorporating active instrumentation to help you in decision making.
you always need to keep in mind that this is truly a systems approach. In order to implement your design philosophy, the ground, the support system, the construction methods all play a role and you have to have a strong appreciation of how all three of these components interact to influence your ability to design and excavate uh, a, a safe, uh, safe passage through. A slight diversion is a, a short comment on risk and this is a slide from Clayton. It's a little old but it does still represent a distribution of where you see some of the risks coming from in underground works and you'll see that uh, soil properties and groundwater uh, represent a fairly significant component. Uh, you include the lack of investigation and the possibility of running into obstructions and you can see that having a good knowledge of the ground uh, can help you substantially mitigate and manage your risk before you begin your, your excavation process. But you also need to understand what your risk profile is, not only you as either a contractor or designer but also the owner of this particular activity. So one of the questions you need to ask is what is your risk position? Um, are you one that accepts risks or are you one that avoids risks? And these are critical questions that you will need to, to understand as you move forward in your design and construction process. Site investigation always deserves at least a few uh, comments because it plays such a substantial role in a safe and reliable excavation. You have a general understanding of your regional geology. Uh, I'm in the Seattle area and what we have up here is ground conditions that were formed uh, in very diverse and leads to a high degree of uncertainty in a lot of occasions for our understanding of ground conditions. So the regional geology and the historical geology play a very strong part and they may in your area of, uh, of expert or area of practice as well. And you want to be able to attack both laboratory field and sample retrieval with a range of tools that represent what you need to know and to gain that knowledge as best you can prior to uh, beginning your design and construction. One of the things I'm always reminded of when, I, uh, when I'm with my, uh, my colleague Harvey Parker is that when we perform explorations we're putting in very uh, limited, very small in size explorations to retrieve samples and it's kind of like trying to understand what's in a 50 gallon drums uh, from a thimble of information. So we have to remember that and keep that in mind uh, very clearly as we, as we move forward and try to understand the ground we're uh, using for design and construction purposes. Now there is quite a bit of guidance out there and one of the documents that you can uh, go to and get some ideas for investigative strategies as well as other information is from the International Tunneling Association and these are free and downloadable and I would encourage you to uh, to visit the website and see what literature is available for you in your libraries. So moving on with site investigations what is in between your boreholes and why is that important because you can't make good information or good decisions with bad information and you also can only perform an analysis uh, only as good as the data of which you have and another kind of go by is interpretation is always open to interpretation so these are areas where we have, a, have to apply uh, some knowledge, uh, some judgment and moving forward with gaining information about the ground and how we expect it to perform. So how do we gain information about the ground, particularly material properties and parameters for design? Well, one of the first things we can do is guess. Well, we certainly would not like to use this as a preferred method, although we are forced into that in some cases and we have to go to the literature and, and see what might be available about uh, ground conditions and where we're performing the construction. But certainly it's uh, a path of last resort I would, I would suggest. 
field testing is certainly a, a good opportunity, whether it's uh, in situ techniques. Uh, just as an aside, the, uh, the column that you see on the left is actually the largest unconfined compressive test that I've ever seen. This was in the elephant caves outside of Mumbai in India. But we do have a range of field tests available, uh, whether it's pressure meter tests for modulus values, coring, and other in situ techniques to gain a better understanding of what the ground conditions are. We also have laboratory testing at our disposal and a range, whether it's small or large, uh, samples of which to gain information and an understanding of what the material properties are and how we can select design parameters to move forward with our analysis procedures. One of the things to always keep in mind is to understand where you are and what parameters you're looking at. Uh, if you are in soil, that's one condition, but if you are in rock, uh, where are you and what information do you need? Uh, we're generally obtaining unconfined compressive strength tests on intact rock, but what we really need is rock mass behavior to understand ground conditions and where we are in relation to our excavation and the rock samples that we retrieve uh, need to be uh, used as guidance on what it is that we select and how we proceed to define our material properties and design parameters for analysis. So if we eliminate the guess option, uh, we have field tests, we have laboratory tests, and we have engineering judgment. And engineering judgment plays a large role in what we do, and it should be used based on knowledge, not just a, a whim or a guess. We have information that we can use that's readily available and which we can use to choose among the alternatives for selecting material properties and design parameters. And we should use that to verify and validate how we move forward with our engineering judgment. Now, in engineering judgment, sometimes uh, there is a call to question, and so we as a community need to be attentive to this. Uh, following the Challenger uh, accident, you might recall in the 80s, uh, Richard Feynman, a Nobel laureate physicist, uh, famously quoted that when I see engineers uh, hiding behind engineering judgment, I know they're just making things up. Well, I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but it's hard to argue with a Nobel prized physicist, but it's something we do need to be aware of as we move forward in exercising our edge engineering judgment and the perception of not only our owners, but also the public that we serve in our designs and construction projects. So where does engineering judge com come from? Well, first of all, it comes from experience. And then where do you get the experience? Bad judgment. And this was something that was drilled into me by uh, Professor Fred Kalhawi of Cornell. Um, so be careful with engineering judgment. Use it wisely, but it is a very important and, and use of in, in our profession and practice. I'm going to now move into approaches for analysis. And here we get into some meat and uh, some technology and techniques and how we can approach uh, sequential excavation design. We can use some very theoretical based approach. Here you see the Kirsch equations. Um, but we have to look at what the categories of analysis are that are available to us and what are some of the constraints that need to be understood as we move forward with the use of each of these uh, analysis categories. And you have to be well aware that the solutions in each of the categories require on some fundamental concepts, whether it be equilibrium, strain compatibility, the understanding of material behavior and how you represent that in a constitutive model, and the boundary conditions that are uh, need to be applied uh, to successfully use each of these techniques. And each of them have uh, available solution requirements that you can check off, if you will. And the closed form solutions are very nice and very elegant, but in many cases they're limited to a linear elastic solution, which may or not be what we're looking for in our analysis. Uh, simple or empirical approaches have limitations in terms of where the data might be uh, available for use, and using it outside that range is not advisable, and you need to be 
aware of where those condition and constraints are. Numerical techniques are certainly uh, tools that are available now and are widely used. Uh, they've got a significant number of advantages over other solution technologies and techniques mainly because of their flexibility and we'll talk about that uh, with a, through a couple of slides. One of the advantages that you can see using the numerical approaches over the others is that you can uh, use them to get a better understanding particularly of not only local and global stability conditions but construction staging. And for our application, that is a substantial value because you can look at uh, changes in modulus values with excavation rates and round lengths and see how that's affecting your overall ground response and the ground support that you're choosing to implement. So it's much more flexible, but it also has some uh, concerns and constraints that you need to be aware of as you continue to use them. I know my clients are constantly asking for three-dimensional uh, analysis, uh, but in many cases that may not be the best approach nor should it be your first approach and I would always encourage coupling closed form or simple solutions to help guide your decisions and if nothing else to use them as means to see if your numerical modeling is producing answers that are reasonable as well as some of the experience based techniques we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, because the numerical techniques even though they are very powerful can also produce some very misleading results uh, we certainly don't want to carry out our numbers to nine significant digits uh, what we're really looking for in numerical analysis techniques is are things moving uh, a lot are they moving a little and are the conditions and the changes within what we expect uh, as we move forward in our construction. It's always good to put some caveats on empirical methods. Uh, I mentioned them a little bit before, but while they are simple and you're very popular, uh, it is a way, as John Hudson uh, always used to tell me, is that you can ignore uh, theory and rock properties entirely in applying them. But when you will use these empirical techniques, you have to be very cognizant of where the limitations of these analysis approaches are, whether it's in terms of boundary conditions or whether it's in terms of where the data has been collected and how it's been used in the past or the ground conditions that it's attempted. So while these are very, very strong and very powerful and used widely in our industry, they do have to be used with some level of caution. Um, I've also seen mistakes in units where certain techniques, uh, empirical procedures are presented, but there's a, a, a unit constraint and you need to pay very close attention to those simple things in order not to have erroneous answers. So just a little more detail into why numerical modeling. Uh, the first is you may not have an analytical solution that exists for your particular application. In a lot of our urban environments uh, we have complex and interacting systems and the ability to understand how they interact with our construction sequencing and activities is really cannot be done any other way besides a numerical approach. Uh, the other substantial advantage of, an, of a numerical approach is that just the inherent nature of geomaterials and their uncertainty and your ability to understand those and apply a range of conditions so that you can get a better handle on what the conditions might be as you move forward in your construction. So rather than looking at very specific answers from your numerical analysis, I would encourage you to look at it as a, a process where you understand the interactions within a physical system and use that as a, a way of, of a discovery of what you're looking at and always keep in mind that you are looking at a system of interactions and the numerical tools and techniques whether it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional provide you the opportunity to look at how these systems interact with one another.
just like with any other components, uh, there's a number of things that are involved in, in a numerical analysis. And I would encourage you to consider that the biggest uncertainty here is the user. Um, the ability to understand the code you're using, the constitutive models, uh, play a very heavy role in the precision and accuracy that you will achieve with the application of these, these particular tools, uh, even though they are very, very powerful. <clears throat> so just as a bit of a summary, you, you could really account for a number of uh, situations explicitly, construction procedures and sequencing, which is very important, but you also need to understand what it is that you are trying to uh, simulate. I've seen a number of cases where uh, numerical tools have been used and somebody has used a very simple more cool model in an unloading situation and the deformations have been very large where the the more cool model is really not an appropriate for excessive unloading conditions so it won't be representative of of the conditions that will actually occur in the ground even though it looks like numerically you're having very large uh, displacements that need to be managed and it will influence your your choice of uh, let's say ground support conditions I mentioned earlier that a lot of our clients these days are looking for three-dimensional uh, uh, analysis. Uh, Two-dimensional approaches still are very good in a plane strain application. Uh, we can get an idea of what our ground conditions are, what our support requirements are, uh, when our sequencing should be for, uh, for application, as well as understanding of groundwater conditions and under steady state or, or unsteady flow conditions. We do have to appreciate some of our, our uh, analysis constraints, whether we're looking at plane strain conditions or axisymmetric and the differences between these approaches. And without question, the ability to understand the material behavior is one of the more complex components of numerical analysis. The constitutive model uh, on how you represent the ground behavior under conditions is it's a very critical aspect to going forward in your design. Um, simple more Coulomb techniques with a friction angle and cohesion or an unconfined compressive strength uh, provide you one set of conditions, uh, but today it's much more advisable to go into a full plasticity condition like a hardening model uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, included in many of our codes uh, today where you can get full plasticity analysis and an understanding of your energy uh, conditions with each loading and unloading condition and a better understanding of your stage construction operations. So these are very advanced techniques that require additional, um, additional knowledge to go forward both in material selection for the properties that go into the models and the uh, material properties uh, constitutive model itself. So when we look at our analysis for underground construction, it's really a systems approach. Uh, it encompasses uh, not only the construction and different analysis techniques, along with our traditional uh, ways of, of looking at uh, ground behavior, but also a significant component of engineering judgment. Ground classification has been uh, a component of sequential excavation construction for a number of years, and there's a number of ways that are represented in the literature to understand ground, and these have been memorialized uh, by a number. Uh, one reference that is very strong is Beniowski's uh, reference in 1989. These, uh, these different ground mass classifications can be used and they've memorialized everything from ground support to advanced conditions to the ability to understand what class of ground needs to be managed. And these can be uh, reviewed uh, in those kind of references. And what you choose can almost be a personal preference. Uh, GSI is, is a common uh, ground mass classification these days, as well as RMR, and if you're well versed in the Q system, it's, it's very good and very detailed for understanding rock masks uh, characteristics. The next few slides are just several examples uh, from the Beniowski reference where he categorizes different types of ground conditions uh, from very good to very poor, and in these 
individual classifications provides guidance for what you can use for sections, round lengths, uh, stand-up time, and the kind of behavior that you can anticipate. So these are very good references to give you a sense of what you can anticipate qualitatively uh, in your ground conditions as you looked into an SEM type of design and construction operation. Again, additional um, details that are provided to give you guidance to support your more hard analysis techniques. And again, it's always good to use these and, and understand what these are saying versus what your calculations are saying to make sure that you're getting some type of convergence. Um, as you do your final selection for your design and construction means and methods. Again, just another example of different sequences of excavation and you can see the top heading and different bench uh, elements for the construction and for a ground classification uh, classified as ground condition 4. So these are go-bys that you can use as information sources as you work uh, in your design and construction. Stand-up time and ground behavior is a significant component and these were uh, first propagated back by Laufer in the 50s and again there's different components and correlations between ground classifications and what you can expect on stand-up time and how they would affect things like your excavation and support method as well as your rate of excavation. Again just another example uh, from Laufer on the kind of uh, ground support and stand-up time that you can anticipate with each of these ground types. Other texts that you can use, again, additional information, stand-up time uh, versus unsupported span length. So these, again, are guidance documents. When you do analysis, however, the first thing that you need is loads. And uh, this is an image from Terzaghi's Theoretical Soil Mechanics where he addresses ground uh, loading on, on a tunnel using his trapdoor concept. And what we see normally is uh, ground load as a result of a different uh, opening or, or height of a tunnel, but these are based on actual theoretical analysis that Terzaghi did and using a, a, an Coulomb law for material behavior. But when you sum the forces and you do the analysis and assess the boundary conditions, it comes into a differential equation. And what Terzaghi did was apply some boundary conditions and lo and behold, we get vertical loads uh, 2 times b, which is where these uh, come from. So it, it's not just necessarily a table in your, in your textbooks, but these are really have a theoretical basis behind them. And uh, I encourage you to solve that differential equation to see if you get the same result that Terzaghi did 60 or 70 years ago. But these are the tables, um, you know, out of our, uh, our standard textbooks. And these are the ones that we use to get ground loads. These are two uh, books from commercial shearing that are still available. Uh, if not from uh, DSI directly, uh, certainly I've found my several copies uh, on used bookstores in the web, which are very good to have in your library. And they have a tremendous amount of value and information contained in them. So I would encourage you, if you can, to get copies of these for your library. When you're, when you're uh, considering a sequential excavation method, uh, as you excavate, the ground moves no, uh, not only in front of you at the, at the face of the tunnel, but also at the crown and the invert. And the figure on the right comes from the Austrian Society for Geomechanics, where you're looking at uh, general conditions, where you're looking at two times the diameter uh, ahead of the tunnel and above the crown, where you can see these deformations occurring. Now these are important because a fundamental concept in the sequential excavation method is to use what's called ground reaction or ground support curves. And this is an example and there's some very good uh, guidance literature in the Rock Science websites where Everett Hook has his Hook's Corner with his uh, very uh, extensive literature available that you can download um, for your review in your libraries. But the ground reaction curve essentially allows you to plot the ground, ground pressure versus an inward or convergence displacement. And the, the, the 
curve here is the ground response and you can see different occasions or different components where you see the initial in situ conditions and then you have the ground response elastically it begins to move into plastic failure and what you do with these ground reaction curves is this is one for let's say the crown of the tunnel and then you would apply what you would consider a su proper support with its stiffness and then you can calculate a factor of safety uh, for matching both the ground response using these ground reaction curves and the type of support that you'd like to apply and what you're seeing here is that the distance of the initial ground convergence before you apply that support the stiffness of that support and its ultimate yield of that individual system now applying these ground support systems uh, there's guidance that if you have small amounts of uh, tunnel convergence and it's too stiff, it's maybe too early, so you're minimizing your your round length and support and adding extra work, or sometimes it might be too stiff, and certainly you don't want to apply it too late because if you apply it too late, then you're jeopardizing both the workers and the uh, the fidelity of the opening. So you want to be able to match this this ground reaction curve with your support requirements so that you get it right on the critical area or slightly before at an appropriate stiffness with a factor of safety that you find uh, acceptable for your particular application that you're designing for. This is an example from uh, uh, designing a ground reaction curve and what you see for this particular example is that uh, the support was was applied after a substantial amount of, of convergence of the tunnel and it was not nearly stiff enough to for the tunnel response so this was a poor judgment in terms of applying ground support uh, for this particular application and this was from uh, rock support which is a uh, rock science uh, program that you can you can use or there's also a empirical approach that is presented in hook that you can also use uh, in, if you don't have a, access to the software ground support uh, there's a number of things available to you in terms of the crown and the uh, the sidewalls of the tunnel we don't really have time to go into a lot of the details of each of the individual components but if you have access to uh, the commercial shearing documents I referenced earlier that you can that you can I think get from from DSI there are ways to calculate your thrust and moment capacity so you very much are integrating uh, structural with your geotechnical capacity and capability here but these are tools uh, that you can quick quick uh, analysis results for whether or not you've got uh, capacity and, and shear component issues to the support that you'd like to use in the ground. There is guidance. Uh, it's not exactly a easy to find reference, but Stillboard provides some ideas and, and concepts on your ground uh, reaction as well as your ability to supply ground uh, bolting technologies and the length and distribution of them within your within your arch these tools are available and they can provide you guidance on the length and, and spacing and distribution uh, for uh, support for your roof as well as your sidewalls there's also analysis techniques available uh, that you can look at coupling your uh, geologic investigations with your fracture spacing uh, frequency and orientation uh, into an analysis uh, three-dimensionally to look at your rock block conditions and providing the appropriate length and distribution of dowels or supports that are uh, required to safely uh, bolt the roof and create a safe excavation. You can go to a more uh, traditional uh, rock uh, a spring and mash uh, kind of consideration from a structural approach uh, where there's uh, techniques for stiffnesses and ground reaction to, to get uh, spring constants that are going to a, a simple beam analysis uh, that you or structural engineers would would generally apply uh, and again the loads are derived from the geotechnical conditions that need to be very well understood 
uh, to make sure these springs and dash pots represent reasonable considerations for the ground as you look at the shear and moment capacity of the support requirements. One area that's, uh, that's needed is also a advanced support uh, at, at certain times. And this could be spiles, it could be pipe uh, umbrellas or canopies. And we talked about the Terzaghi silo loads previously, and these are used to look at the ground conditions to support uh, what your spile or pipe canopy needs to support, and whether or not you are looking at the ground conditions ahead of the excavation so that you can safely uh, proceed with your construction round. You have to pay close attention to the geometries here. Um, these are simple beam calculations, if you will, and they can be used uh, to help you guide not only the diameter of your pipes, the lengths, and whether or not they, the grouting operations and the kind of pipe arch support that you can anticipate. And there are also some, some very good papers uh, by those of DSI that address uh, pipe canopy with instrumented applications and case studies that are also nice uh, materials to include in your library. Face support and wedge models, uh, again, can be simple analytic uh, can, uh, approaches. Uh, a lot of times if you've got face stability conditions, you'll apply a, a face wedge um, and understanding whether or not that needs to be there and its component uh, within the excavation sequence can be done in a very simple wedge fashion. Uh, looking at um, these kind of approaches based on the opening of the excavation and the anticipated ground loads uh, at the crown of the tunnel. The kind of tunnel and the size also has a very large role to play, so you want to pay very close attention to, to that in your design and construction and your application to what you might see at the surface. Just a simple example of what you might see in terms of advanced support, both in jet grouting to spiles or for poling and, and spile applications or pipe umbrellas. Regardless of your tunneling technology, you do have to pay very close attention to what happens at the surface. Uh, this was an application, this was a, a project where uh, the owner said we don't really need that much information and it wound up into a very uh, substantial area of running ground. And if you've never been to a flooded TBM, it's not a pretty sight. So uh, we do have to pay attention to what goes on at the surface. Um, things that have influenced the surface settlements are everything from face stability to your, to your vibrations, to groundwater operations, and your construction sequence and staging. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of these today, but this is something that you do need to keep in the back of your mind. Instrumentation. Uh, today is an integral part in uh, sequential excavation operations. Uh, instrumentation is placed both in the tunnel and at the ground surface, and these are monitored in a very active uh, way, and they're used on a daily basis at your, your morning meetings to understand the, the, ver uh, the veracity of your design and how well it's being implemented and, and whether or not you're anticipating uh, the support requirements and the ground response that you uh, were predicting. So it's also very good in, in verifi verifying your design and support parameters. Uh, safety is always a high priority here. Uh, we want a safe and uh, excavation for all those involved. And we can actively uh, match our tunnel deformation and pressures that we anticipated during our uh, ground uh, identification and design component of the project. Just a quick example of some of the instruments that you can place in and around the tunnel and use these as feedback mechanisms during your design and construction. Uh, laser technologies are commonly used not only to verify things like shotcrete support and thicknesses these days for uh, meeting construction constraints and requirements and contract obligations, uh, and all, but also to actively monitor how the ground is moving uh, during your construction operation. And you'll see these, whether it's from a divot technology, there's uh, several individuals who provide this service here in the U.S., and Amberg Technologies is another 
firm that provides these laser scanning technologies for use during sequential excavation design and construction. Some of the techniques are now being used with advanced visualization options to understand your ground support better and rock mass characterization and compare with what you did on your initial geologic investigation. So these are some of the new tools that are being used to interactively and converge on solutions during construction. So certainly it becomes a very useful tool for verification of the excavation profile, uh, enhanced information for your rock support during construction, and certainly a verification for your, for your analysis and design. Just a few words on thresholds. Uh, many times in our contracts we're asked to provide uh, certain thresholds between warning and stop work. Uh, there's some guidance here by Sukarai in terms of tunnel convergence and warning levels. And again, this matches up with the instrumentation that you're, you're using. Uh, Hook and Marinos also provide some limiting strains based on rock mass strength and the strains that you're observing in your ground conditions. So these are references that you can go to to use as tools to help develop those threshold parameters uh, that you might need to provide for contractual work uh, uh, during your contract. The excavation, uh, there's a number of slides that I've hidden in the presentation and if you'd like the full copy I'm more than happy to provide those. But what we're looking at is essentially how we uh, excavated different sequence and that's going to be directly related to your ground conditions and the support requirements. Uh, typically we're, we're looking at a top heading and bench and we're looking at a, an analysis that really uses a thick ring or a thick cylinder for closure so you want to be able to close that invert during construction relatively quickly uh, depending on the ground conditions. I've done some work in some very hard rock where closing the invert wasn't necessarily needed in, in an expeditious or even at all. Or in softer grounds you need to pay very close attention to closing that invert so that you have a stable base uh, and invert to continue construction on. But whether your top heading is sequenced from left to right, whether or not you have a mid-span girder, the bench is excavated in one or two sequences is all dependent on your ground conditions and how the, your analysis and your ground reaction curves evolve and how you choose how that sequence should, uh, should be proceeding. If anything, one of the things I've hoped I've conveyed is that the sequential excavation method is really a systems approach. You really have to think about what your outcome is and consider that outcome from the initial ground understanding and your uh, investigation methods, your analysis techniques, the use of comparing and contrasting different analysis techniques to look and understand whether or not your system has got the behavior that you are anticipating, engaging that behavior with your actual construction observations. So I'd very much encourage you to think about these kind of uh, approaches to tunnel design and construction as a full uh, systems idea that what your outcome is is directly uh, important to what your initial inputs are and the process all the way through. This gentleman who, if you've never had the, the opportunity to meet him or, or, or know who he is, this is Ralph Peck uh, of the Terzaghi and Peck, uh, uni professor at University of Illinois and uh, one of the founding fathers of our geotechnical profession. But one of the things I like to leave my, uh, my audience or, or students with is, is one of Peck's go-bys and that is construction deserves more attention and design. And there's nothing more important, uh, particularly in our tunnel application, than I believe this statement. The other thing is how you apply that engineering judgment. And this is a range of use of tools, uh, understanding what the work of others and case studies, and really honing those skills so that you can bring that judgment to the, in the broadest sense to both your planning as well as design and construction. The next slides are just a reference list. Uh, these will be available, I understand, so that you can go and, and publish and, and populate your library as you see fit.
That concludes the material I have for you this morning. Uh, if we have any questions, I'll certainly be uh, uh, attempt to entertain answerings to them. Uh, I'll also be attending the RETC this uh, this coming week, so if you catch me there, or if you'd like a full copy of the presentation, you can also feel free to email me, and I'll provide those as well. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Felice, for a fascinating presentation. We'd like to open up the um, uh, questions from the attendees, if they would like to use the chat panel. We will read the questions aloud to, uh, to Dr. Felice. This is, as he noted, being recorded. The session will be available on the UCA um, website within 48 hours. You will receive an email with a notice uh, on how to access that presentation. Uh, Dr. Felice, we don't seem to have any uh, questions. Yes, we do. Here's the first one. How do we confer, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we convert the deformations from the soil to a time span when we can add the support? One way to do that is to look at your stand-up time. Uh, and the guidance by Laffer is still as good. Uh, and if you go, I can't remember which slide number it might be, but uh, there are uh, ground classifications uh, and stand-up time uh, charts that are used as your best way to, to go ahead and address that issue. You can find those references in uh, a book. It's uh, Geologic Engineering. And I think the references included, it's, uh, it's by Gonzalez and Ferrier, as well as the Beniowski reference also provides uh, guidance on stand-up time and ground classification. Thank you. The next question reads, what exactly do you mean by compatibility in numerical modeling? Compatibility is uh, is usually meant in small strain analysis where you have to maintain compatibility in strains. So in other words, from one element to the next or one node to the next. It's a, a theoretical concept that has to be uh, applied as you develop your numerical techniques. Generally, those are transparent to us and they're built into the codes, whether it's PLAC, FLAXIS, uh, RS2. Uh, so those are sort of behind the scenes. Uh, to us nowadays, but it is a, a theoretical concept in continuum mechanics as you develop your your modeling uh, numerics within within the codes. Great, thank you, Conrad. We have a comment. Uh, one of the attendees says, "Thanks for all the information presented. It was very well organized." Thank you very much. And it appears that was the, um, the last question. I thank everyone for joining us today. You're, feel free to, con to contact uh, Dr. Felice at the information given on the last slide. And this ends today's recording. Have a nice day.